Hi, everybody. It's Matt from Discover College Soccer. I hope you're enjoying the podcast, whether that's on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I also wanted to let you know about the Discover College Soccer Study Table. This is our brand new online portal that is complete with a 14-part online course giving you all of the ins and outs of the college soccer recruiting process. There's also a wealth of resources such as checklists, templates, there's the spreadsheets that have every soccer program in the country along with their coaches, their contact information, their social media information, uh, some basic stats about the school and more. Plus there's an online community where you can ask your questions, share your wins, your losses, any questions that you may have around the college soccer recruiting process. It's all there at the Discover College Soccer study table that you can find at discovercollegesoccer.com slash study table and hopefully we will see you there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. I'm lucky enough today to be joined by Coach Marco from Ripon up in Wisconsin. Welcome, Coach. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, excited to chat. So it's June 14th, uh, you know, for, for Division three schools, not uh, not that big of a deal. But uh, for a lot of kids, tomorrow is <laughs> going to be a big deal. But uh, yeah. In terms of the recruiting calendar, I'm guessing you've you've wrapped up the 23s and you're hard at work on the 24s, but uh, can you just give me an overview of what your typical recruiting calendar looks like when you're talking to what classes and how far out you're, you're talking to people and what just what that kind of looks like? Sure. Yeah. So for, for me, uh, we, we normally start, for example, for our 24 class, we start about February. Uh, we're starting to collect names probably, uh, you know, the, the fall before and then uh, more formal contact begins with that class February and into March. Um, and I'm pretty, I mean, I know every coach is a little bit different. I'm a little bit, uh, rigid with, with my recruiting and kind of the way I, the way I communicate with athletes and, and their families, uh, and work through the process. Um, we, we really, we try to identify guys early and basically just give them a checklist of here are the things that we expect you to be doing during this evaluation process while, while we're working with you. And, as we progress into the summer, um, you know, at this point, we've, we've already started to cut our pool down pretty significantly. Um, I'd say probably we've cut out 30 to 40 percent of the guys that we had started with in, in February. And uh, as we, we kind of come into the fall, then uh, that's when we're going to we're going to start pushing offers on guys and getting guys starting starting to visit and things like that. And and generally we wrap classes up um, from a timeline perspective. Last two years, we I've been very happy to be almost done by January. You know, of course, there's always a couple of guys you're still working with, you know, into February and even even March. But um, generally, yeah, January and by by February one, we're we're mostly done with our class. Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, you and I were talking about your location there before the call there in the Midwest. Yep. So, in terms of events and and places you like to go recruiting, kind of what's on your hit list to to make sure you get to each other. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think when I first started, I was everywhere, like just you know driving and driving and driving. I started in 2019, and and as I uh, over the last couple of years, I think I've refined that a little bit. And so um, I spend a lot of time in the Chicago area at all of the the state and president cup events there. Um, Rockford Raptors host a lot of events that I go down to because it's an easy drive and they always attract a lot of the top teams there. Libertyville hosts a lot of great events. FC United hosts a lot of great events. Galaxy. Um, so we spend a lot of time at their showcase stuff. Um, in the Milwaukee area, uh, we always head down to FC Wisconsin and Germantown hosts a lot. Uh, so I, I spend a lot of time over there. Um, uh, they have ECNL teams and, and Midwest regional teams. So it's really nice to, to go and see the athletes in those areas. And then in Wisconsin here, um, our state cup and president's cup are, are hosted just like about an hour from our school. So that's really nice for me. Um, and then throughout the rest of the year, I mean, those are all pretty spring oriented ideas, you know, and things or late spring, early summer. I really like the games. I think that's a, a thing that's a little bit different than like a lot of, a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches want to do showcase where they're going to uh, really big, you know, showcase events where there's tons and tons of teams um, and, and maybe I'm wrong with it. I think the quality sometimes is like kind of poor in the showcases because they've got the kids playing, you know, three games in three days or, or sometimes more than one game in a day. And, um, and I, I think it's just hard to really know, like you really see guys. And, and then I think the last piece too, with that is, 
I'm pretty targeted with who I'm going to see. So, um, you know, when I go to a showcase, of course, you're going to try to find a lot of different guys, but, but a lead game, I'm going to see one guy or two guys. It's not, it's not scouting in the fat, in the sense that I'm trying to find somebody I've never seen before. It's scouting in the sense that I know this guy's good and I want to know more about him. Um, so that's kind of how I tend to do my, my recruiting and my scouting. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned that, that just seeing a, you're going to see people, you know, or you're focused. So in terms of if you're at a showcase event or, or a bigger event, kind of tell me about how that works for you in terms of how much of it, what's maybe the percentage of players you're going to see. Cause you know, or you, you've, you've, they've reached out to you or they're on your radar versus, uh, you know, divine intervention of just going <laughs> yeah. to see a game of, uh, of two teams and finding somebody there. Yeah, it's probably 50, 50. I, I think that that'd be reasonable to say. Um, I hate to jump on the fence on that question, but it's probably 50, no, 50, no. um, half the guys, uh, as you, you mentioned, getting on the radar. Right. And I think that, um, and I, I, I tell this to, to players all the time and, and I've been invited by clubs to talk about, um, the college search process. I've gone to high schools. I, and one of the first things I always say is, is, is be an advocate for yourself, right. And, and, and make sure that you're sending out emails and sharing highlights and texting coaches. And, um, you know, some, some coaches are maybe a little less receptive to that, but I, I think the good, the good coaches, that's what they want. You know, they want to develop a relationship. They want to hear who you are and, and how you're, pro how you're progressing. So, um, yeah, we definitely have guys like that. And then of course, you know, you go to a, go to a match or a showcase or whatever, and you watch guys play. And, um, and of course you're trying to identify talent, right. And, and sometimes you're lucky enough to find a guy, a, a diamond in the rough or a, a guy that, um, you know, is, is really interested in playing at the next level. And, and sometimes you find guys that aren't, so, you know, aren't, aren't ready for that or don't want to. And, and that's just kind of how that goes. Okay. Yeah. Well, do camps and clinics fit into your recruiting process at all, whether they're your own or do you guys work external camps? How does that look? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we host a camp at the end of July uh, every year. So this year it's the 28th. It's a Friday. And um, so we, we host our own camp. Um, and then I think this year we'll do some indoor stuff. We have a nice indoor facility. So we'll probably do some indoor stuff as well, uh, which we haven't done before. Uh, generally, like this last year's class, uh, we brought in um, 10 guys and two of them were out of our, our camp, uh, which is kind of cool. Like, you know, to, to I always say for us camp, when we're inviting guys, we, we don't do like a huge widespread camp invite. We invite guys that we know are really good and that we want, right, to get here. And so uh, we always say for the, the guys that we're inviting to camp, um, you know, of course, it's a chance for us to see you, but it's more a chance for them to see us, like see our facilities, see our staff, you know, meet some players, figure out what it's like here, you know. Um, and then in terms of external camps, uh, yeah, we, we I, I do quite a few. Um, I have a pretty good relationship with um, – University of Wisconsin Madison coaching staff and the Green Bay coaching staff, and so they invite us to all their ID camps. Um, sometimes in a working capacity, and sometimes just in an observational capacity. And um, so we we go to those every year, and uh, a couple of them at Madison, a couple at Green Bay as well. Okay, well, whether it's camps, clinics, events, everything under the sun, when you're looking at players. What's your hierarchy of things that you're looking for, whether it's on the field stuff or off the field stuff? Yeah, um, well, I think both those are really important. Uh, so I'll start with I'll start with on the field stuff. Um, you know, the the first thing I look for, especially when we're talking attacking players, but but defensive players as well, are players that take ownership of the match, and so guys that are trying to to make plays, guys that are encouraging their teammates on the field, guys that are have really high work rate, you know, and, and I think something that's maybe a little different is I look for dribblers a lot. It's something I really like. It's something I really value as a coach. Um, so, you know, guys that aren't afraid to try to take people on guys that aren't afraid to try to, to create in the box and create service. And um, even if they fail at that, I, I really value guys that, that want to do those things. Um, I think the it's a hard thing sometimes to evaluate, but I think recognition and understanding of space is really important to me um, on both sides of the ball. So for the attacking players, um, are they threatening to get in behind? Are they are they working to create space off off of uh, the, the defensive players that are uh, they're playing against? Um, you know, do they do they recognize when it's time to combine and when it's time to to take guys on? I think that's important. And then on the defensive side. Um, 
you know, I, th I think kind of when, when are, when are we pressing and when are we challenging for balls? And then when should we be dropping back and conceding some space? And I know some of those things can be a little subjective, Matt, right? Like each coach kind of has a thing that they like more or, but that's something I definitely look for. And then um, you said off the field stuff, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think it's a people business. Uh, you know, you said you're a coach as well. I think you you probably realize that coaches realize that more than anything else, that the people that you bring into your program, the people that you bring into your team, it's the most important thing, probably even more important sometimes than the talent that you bring in. So, you know, good, good young men that, that um, are hardworking, are respectful, have good communication skills. You don't have to be a 4.0 student, but you got to have some, you got to have some academic skills and some ambitions, right. With your life about what you're excited about to do. And, um, and then I just think, I like to spend time talking with coaches about, about their guys too. Um, and just asking them, you know, like, who is this person more than more so than who they are as a player, because, um, you know, I have to kind of develop my, my own understanding of who they are as a player, but I, it's really hard to get to know them as people before they get here. Right. So I think, yeah, I hope, does that kind of give you a feel? Those are kind of the things I probably yeah. search for. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let's yeah. talk a little bit more about the the school. I'm sure there's some folks out there not familiar sure. with with Ripon. So you've got a unique uh, experience that you could share with us as an alum and now a coach. So sure. um, kind of what do you love about the school? What are some awesome things about the school? Maybe some things we wouldn't know just by going through the website. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think... I think Ripon's a really interesting school in that uh, it's always been very, very strong academically. Um, and I think if you rewind into the, you know, into the eighties, we, we, we really were you know, people, people would compare us with like high end East coast Ivy league, you know, and like, like things like that, which is kind of wild. And um, so it's always been very strong academically. Um, what's happened that I think has changed a lot in the last, I don't know, five or six years is the school has said, Hey, we've always been good academically. Now, how can we add the athletic experience to that as well? And so that the, the way that went was in, in 2018, we built a new $25 million athletic facility that I'm sitting in now where all of our, our, our offices are and gyms and a field house. And it's it just, it's beautiful. And right now across the street, uh, we're building a new stadium, about a $9 million project, which is uh, turf and lights and team rooms built underneath. And I mean, it's like, it's dreamland. And like you said, for me as an alum, I played here 2008 to 2012, um, which feels like kind of a long time ago now. And and we didn't have any of those fancy things, right? And it's, so it's really exciting and fun. And uh, we're building a brand new $20 million science center right now. Um, and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm trying to flex with all of our money, but for a small school, when there's so much investment and in infrastructure going on, it, it's super exciting. Um, and quite honestly, it's not the trend. If you look around the country right now, with what's happening with, with especially liberal arts schools. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, a, a wonderful little city as well. Ripon is, uh, it's cool. It's really nice downtown with coffee shop and brewery and, uh, and, and great restaurants and music venues. And, and it's all walkable to our campus. So I think it creates a really positive college environment, especially for, people that are really focused on their academics and really focused on their soccer. You know, I think those that's, it's really strong in those areas. Um, and then just in terms of like things we're good at uh, most of the guys, not all, but most of the guys on our team are in pre-med. So that's kind of the track that they go with, or they go with that business track. And um, when our guys do business majors, most of them are double majoring. Uh, we have a credit structure that lets our guys do that. It's it's uh, we don't have a lot of required coursework, basically. I won't go into the weeds on it, but um, it allows them to do a lot. So we have a lot of guys doing like business econ or business communications, um, business finance, business sports management, something like that. Uh, a lot of those guys then will minor. We push for a minor in data science normally with that. Um, so that's kind of been the the combo. And then the pre med thing is we've always had really strong science fields here. Um, I'm a former biology major from the program here and I'm somehow coaching college soccer now. And uh, we have really good placement rates in the med school. That's why. So it just, it, it attracts a lot of, of people that want to go that route. Okay. So, well, yeah. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's talk about kind of in season schedule. What's that look sure. like uh, for a player, you know, your average week, w w winter meals, classes, practice times, game cadence, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Great question. Um, so 
generally, uh, and of course, as you know, the weeks change a little bit week to week, but we try to get them pretty structured. And so for our team, generally it's uh, Wednesday match day and then Saturday match day. And so then we have to build everything around that. And that's pretty standard for most colleges now. I think everyone's moving in that direction. Um, so what we'll do is uh, Mondays will be our strength and conditioning day. Uh, so we'll, we have a full-time strength and conditioning coach on staff, which is really nice uh, for us. So our guys will meet with uh, meet with him for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. It's balance work, a little bit of agility, recovery, muscle maintenance, things like that. And then we're out to the field um, for a shorter session. We, we generally on Mondays do um, just some technical work. It's It's still technically, you know, two days post-match on a Saturday, it's kind of recovery still for some of the boys. Um, and then we're into uh, the classroom normally for just a, a short film recap of some of the film from the week before. Moving to Tuesday, it's match prep day. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do, we normally start in the classroom then with a little scout of the opposition, talking a little bit about the schedule so the boys know for travel. Um, and then we're out to the field for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, we've got a couple, four or five pretty standard sessions that we use for pre-match um to, to prep the boys and then uh we move into wednesday match day uh thursday is the only weird day for us because uh, we will play some reserve games on thursdays so we might have um it's the only time that we might kind of separate our team right where we'll have some guys that played a lot of minutes wednesday they need recovery work and then some guys that didn't play so many minutes need need to play right they need to compete and so We'll play reserve matches or we might even play inner squad scrimmages on Thursday with those boys. And then Friday is uh, a prep day again. Um, same schedule as Tuesday, Saturday match. And then we, we do Sunday as our off day um, in, in general. So um, building around that then, like with classes and, and things like that, generally at Ripon, uh, classes start at eight or nine in the morning and are done by about three, you know, and, and uh, it depends a little bit. We're pretty class heavy on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. And we're pretty class light on Tuesdays, Thursdays. Um, and so uh, we train 4.30 to 6.30 or once a week, maybe 6.30 to 8.30 at the later slot. Um, we, we try not to do too much late stuff just because I know a lot of the guys have tutoring or they have jobs or they have things like that that they're doing in the evenings. And so we, we try to leave that slot open. But we schedule it all. It's all out by July, right? So our boys can they can schedule their things around it. They know what's going on. Um, obviously, our schedule is going to change a little bit, Matt, when the stadium's finished because uh, we're going to have another a turf facility right across the street, two grass facilities right outside the building. Um, so we have a lot to pick from, uh, but we have to balance that with the football team and with the women's soccer team. And so we luckily we have nice relationships in our department. Everybody's really cool, and everyone just sits down at a table together and says, "How how do we want to make this work?" So, good. All right. Well, yeah. you mentioned you know having a, a reserve team game and, and that kind of thing. So, tell me about the roster size. What what does that look like? What what are you aiming for there on an average year? Yeah, we we target um, thirty six to thirty eight a year, and for me, I think it's a little heavy in terms of numbers. Uh, but the the reality of it is that is this: if we we experimented when I first started here with about 30 players. And what we found was the guys that really get hurt in that situation are numbers 25 to 30 or 20 or 23 to 30, right? Because they're the guys that probably aren't going to see the field that much during the season, uh, maybe a little bit here and there. Um, but a lot of them are good players. Like they, they, they maybe are freshmen or sophomore players or, even, you know, they are even junior players that are, are could and, and, often do develop into players that are going to see minutes in our program. And so the issue was at 32, if you have, let's say two or three injuries, you don't have enough for a reserve match, right? You can't, we can't show up to a game even because we need to make sure we have 18 to 20 available for match day. And with the NCAA rules of 20 total matches that you're allowed to play, including reserve, um, you can do the math. You start cutting a lot of guys out as available. And so, what we did was we said, all right, we're going to carry a, a few more players and it's going to allow us to be consistent with those reserve matches. And we've had guys um, this last year, we had um, three freshman players that played the first three reserve matches, four reserve matches, didn't play the first three weeks of the season with, with the first team in a, in a match. And by the end of the season, they were starting games. And so I think to me, that's really, really important um, that, that we can, we can do that for a development and then be student athlete experience so that they're being competitive and having fun with that. Um, I think the, the big thing that I will say is um, 
when, and, and we wanted to make sure we did this right. It was like, we needed to make sure we had enough staff to support a team of, of that size. And we do now, uh, that was not the case when I first started here. We, we now have myself and four assistant coaches uh, and wow. two student managers. So we have, we have a bigger staff than a lot of division one programs, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and the, and, and then we had to make sure that, you know, we had the resources for, for those athletes as well, um, that we have jerseys and that we have equipment and we were very strict on this. Everyone always trains together. Okay. We, we do not, we're not going to, and a lot of schools do that where they're saying, okay, go away. Uh, you guys go away, go train over there. Right. And, and of course there's, there might be a, a day on the Thursday, right. Where, well, there's guys who are playing reserve games and there's guys recovering, but um, we want, we want that to be a, 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 a to, there's a, there to be a good togetherness within the squad. Right. And, and I think that that's a big piece. Um, so everyone needs to train together and our staff needs to be able to evaluate everyone. That's another big piece too, when it comes yeah, to reserve. For sure. Yeah. Well, talk to me about your, your style of coaching team style of play. What does that look like? Sure. Uh, I'm, I, I guess I always, and my guys, um, my guys are funny. We do a lot of feedback with our players. I, I'm a very honest coach uh, and I, I value professionalism within our program. I value relationships within our program. And so uh, my guys get opportunities to provide feedback to our coaching staff throughout the year. Um, my guys are funny. I, I think a couple of years ago, I, I did a I did a survey with our boys and I said, hey, what do you need more of, right, in training? And like 10 of the guys in the team, Matt, they wrote, we want you to yell more. Cause I'm like pretty low key, right? I'm not, I'm not like a, I'm high energy, but I'm not a, I'm not a yeller. It's just not how I operate. And my, I remember I sat down with the group and I said, fellas, all these guys, they said, I want me to yell more. And I said, is that what you want from me? Or is that what you imagine college coaches to be like? Right. And they kind of like, after they thought about it, they thought, oh yeah, it's more just what we imagine it to be like, or they see a manager in the prem, right. Screaming. Yeah. And it's just not really who I am. I, I think on match day, especially, uh, if I'm yelling a ton, um, then I probably haven't done a good job prepping the boys for the match day. Uh, and, and of course, sometimes you need to inject a little energy, right. To the boys. And I, I think that that that's important. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't do a lot of that. Um, I think from a style of pr play perspective and what I believe in as a coach is we, we want the ball, uh, and we want to attract the opposition into our space. And then we want to play into those new spaces, uh, when we attack, I know every coach says that today. I, I just I like that's the same line. And so I really try to support that with some data. And, you know, if we, if you look at, at us this year, we outpossessed and outpassed every team we played in the middle in the attacking third, uh, every team except two throughout the year and two, including matches that we lost and we let our league in goal scored. Uh, and so I think there's a reason for that, right. That, that we were, that we were, we possessed and, and utilized the ball in dangerous areas right it wasn't just like we had a lot of passes but we completed them in our back line and it wasn't like we were progress we like we didn't progress the ball okay i actually have pushed our guys i think we could be more aggressive in the final third i think we became a little too possession obsessed uh you know i want the ball but you have to have product uh and so um defensively then um it depends a little bit on the, the team i mean that we're playing against uh we'll, we'll sometimes play a very high line. And then sometimes we play more of a mid block with pressing traps. It, it depends a little bit on, on who we're playing. Um, but we really, you know, when you think about like kind of prepping the guys throughout the week, we focus on ourselves a lot more than we do opposition. And, and I think maybe at some point we'll evolve a bit more to focusing on opposition, but I just really think at this level, the games come so fast that it's really about, about refining your product, refining what you do as a team and focusing primarily on that. Of course, you need to know a little bit about the other team, uh, but that's kind of how, how we operate as a staff. And, and um, again, like I mentioned before, I'm really lucky to have a nice staff of, of um, you know, D David Scott's my, my first assistant. He's, you know, a licensed coach just got inducted in the Wisconsin hall of fame for soccer. I, I mean, it's really nice to have people with the experience, you know, having a goalkeeper coach, having a coach that deals with a lot of the backroom stuff like film and, and statistics. And, um, you know, having, having a coach uh, that's a young, you know, we have Charles Schultz who's come back, a young guy who had been on the team and knows some of the players, you know what I mean? Like those types of things for our staff to really develop a good relationship with our guys and, and give them what they need from a development perspective. That's been important to me as, as a coach. So.
Yeah, yeah I hope hopefully that kind of answers the question. Yeah, I absolutely. Know. I could go on and on. All of our coaches, once you get us going, right, Matt, we could just talk and talk about it, like, what we do and how we do it. So, it, well, and you know what? That's that's what keeps this uh, podcast enjoyable for me to keep doing is right. having these conversations. Right, right. So, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground, and we really appreciate all the time you've given us. I'm going to end this with one question, and that's, you know, if there was one piece of advice, one nugget that you want to share with. Uh, parents, players, anybody going through this recruiting process, what would that one thing you would want them to know be? Okay. That's a, that's an awesome question. I actually just had this conversation with a, with a recruit on campus the other day and they had asked something really similar. Um, And I think my piece of advice is talk with a lot of coaches, go to a ton of schools. And I know that sometimes I think that parents are surprised to hear that from me. They think that I'm going to say, you don't need to go anywhere else. You've looked here. This is the best school. So just commit here and come here. And I really, when I started coaching in 2019, I think I maybe thought that a little bit. I was nervous. Oh no, they're going to go down the road to X or Y school. And then they're not going to like me and they're going to go somewhere else. And, but, but now what I've found is the young men that go to 10 different schools or five different schools, and they talk with a bunch of different coaches. um, When they commit here, they're really all in on the experience because they've done their research. They understand what we're about. They've challenged me and other coaches with hard questions. And, and when they get here, they understand the expectations. And so then, then they're happy, they're motivated, they're excited. Uh, the families know what they're getting into. Uh, they, they understand what's, what's happening here. And, and they really give themselves to our program and they give themselves to the experience and they're, they're committed to their academics. And I, I just think from a four-year perspective, that's the way to do it. I, I think too often the advice to young people, because we don't know what to tell them about this experience, are things like, oh, when you go there, uh, you'll, you'll just feel that. You'll feel that it's right. You know, you'll get that feeling. And I hate to say it, but it's just, it's not a Disney fairy tale, the college search process. Uh, You might get great feelings about, hey, this coach is really nice or this school is really great, but write those things down. Don't just say that, like, I felt good about it, right? Uh, So that's why that'd be my piece of advice is is do your research, go to a bunch of places, talk to a bunch of coaches, advocate for yourself, and and you'll you'll find a school that, that fits you well. I appreciate that. And that's, again, one of the reasons I did this podcast was so people can learn about as many schools as possible, even if they can't get out to Wisconsin initially. Hopefully For they'll sure. be able to to hear this and uh, and get a good idea of saying why I should come visit and talk to Coach Mark. For sure. So awesome. Well, Coach, really appreciate the time. Wish you the best of luck this upcoming season. And if you get to any recruiting events down here in Bradenton, give me a shout. All right. Will do. Thanks a lot, Matt. I appreciate your time. Thank you.